Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ya ayyuhallazina amanu taqullah wa qulu qawlan sadida yuslih lakum a'malakum wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum wa may yuti'illaha wa rasulahu faqad faza fawzan azima. Amma ba'd. Rabbi syarhi sadri wa yassir amri wa ahlul 'uqdatam min lisani yafqahu qawli. Once again brothers and sisters, welcome back. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. So now we are entering a second topic. And uh, any one of you who would like to get the drinks and the, I mean, the refreshment, the food, come in. Just please bring in, inshallah, no problem. Okay? This is quite a casual workshop. But as long as you manage, you can focus and you can multitask drinking and eating and listening. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> okay? Because I'm afraid uh, maybe once in a while I'm, I might make some joke and while you are eating and you're looking at your friends and you know everything spill out <laughs> just like now yeah okay now alhamdulillah let's go to the second topic and uh, again and again I would like to remind myself and uh, every single one of you that to make our intention right okay to make our intention right for this workshop maybe initially we came here because okay Saturday, Sunday, I have nothing to do. So maybe Saturday, eh, Sunday, I think I can meet some friends here. So why not? You know? Yes, you will get some reward for that, but not the reward for attending, uh, you know, uh, gardens of the paradise. So hopefully we make our intention clear, inshallah. And secondly, brothers and sisters, this workshop, if you come with the expectations that I will be clearing all the misconceptions and all the attack that you guys are facing now, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to answer all the questions and all the attack against Islam now, during this workshop. Because the purpose of this workshop, just for your information, maybe some of you are aware, that this one day workshop, the entire intention and objective is to raise awareness, to motivate more and more Muslim to go out and to do da'wah in their, I mean, according to their own capabilities, according to their own talent. Just do whatever that you can. This is the entire purpose of it. And of course, time to time, I might be covering some of the misconception and some of the attack. And I will be sharing with you guys as well that how the attack begins. What kind of tactic they are using. So we will be more careful Okay, and we can also share with our brothers and sisters, Muslim brothers and sisters who are not here today. Because they need to know as well. Okay, now, let's begin. What is your excuse? Now, every single one of us have an excuse, right? One, somehow or other, we have gave some excuse before in our life. And maybe even now. But let's look into what is the definition of the excuse. Okay, because every single thing we begin with, Definitions. <laughs> Every single thing we begin with excuse. <laughs> okay, let's begin. What is the definition of excuse? According, according to Merriam Webster, something offered as justification or as a ground of being excused. Something. The true definition. <laughs> okay, the lie you tell yourself to make yourself feel better about justifying your lack of responsibility. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> this is my definition, okay? <laughs> so you can you can quote this on your Instagram later. Yeah? <laughs> okay. So this is excuse. But again, brothers and sisters, not all excuse is valid. But in the same time, not all excuse is not invalid. Okay? Not all excuse is invalid, but in the same time, not all excuse is Really, it's how you judge. And for us, as a Muslim, we judge based on the Quran and Sunnah. We judge based on what is apparent to us. Literally, or maybe uh, metaphorical. Because as Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he used to say this word. He said, when the Prophet sallallahu was alive, he knew the rape. He knew the unseen because Allah through Jibril will inform him. So we know what is in the heart. That's why he know the munafikun. 
He gives the list to Huzaifa ibn Yaman radiallahu an. But now, the Prophet no longer with us. So we judge with what is appear to us. If that particular person say that I'm a Muslim, if he say he is a Muslim, but what we see, he didn't really practice Islam. Okay, he still say he's a Muslim, then he's still a Muslim. We are no one to say they are no longer Muslim. What is in their heart is between them and Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Okay. We should be very careful on this because sometimes we easily make takfir on people. Oh, you are disbeliever just because you don't do what I do. Oh, no, Zubila. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Okay? We judge what is appear to us, apparent to us, and then that's it. Move on. Let's go. Why people rejected Islam during the time of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam? They have excuse. These are some of their excuse. And this is not our excuse of not doing da'wah. Yeah. Okay, no, no. This is just guideline. Why people rejected Islam last time. And let's look into what is their excuse. And for us to reflect in our daily life. Number one, arrogant. They're yeah, arrogant. Who is the one that we think of that is arrogant? In the time of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Who is the one? Give me a name, give me a name. Abu Jahal, yes, Abu Jahal. Let's talk about Abu Jahal then. You know what is his original name? Abu Hikam. That is his nickname. But his original name? Hisham. Amru bin Hisham. His original name was Amru bin Hisham. You still remember the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he made dua to Allah? Oh Allah, strengthen Islam with one of the Umar become Muslim. The two Umar is Amru bin Hisham and Umar bin Khattab. But end up Allah guided Umar bin Khattab, not Amru bin Hisham. Because Umar bin Khattab have more humility compared to Abu Jahal. And you know why from Abu, ha- Hakim, Abu Hakam, which is the father of all wise, he's a very wise person, he's very clever. But why out of sudden, his original nickname is Abu Hakam, but then why did we call him as Abu Jahal? <laughs> there is a reason for it. Because he is very clever and he is very smart and he's very wise. He's someone very wise. No one rejected it. Even the Prophet acknowledged that. But you know why it was being changed to Abu Jahal? And who gave him that nickname of Abu Jahal? It's none other than our Prophet Sallallahu <laughs> Where he say, with all this intellect that he has, he is someone that is so clever. But with his intellect, yet he's not being guided to Islam. He cannot be called as the father of all knowledge. <laughs> he should be called as the father of all ignorance. Abu Jahal. So therefore, we still call him as Abu Jahal. There is a lesson from that as well. Which is, despite how smart you are, with your intellect, with the wisdom and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have granted you, but if you refuse to submit, you are still not yet very smart. You are still not yet very smart. For example, according to Islamic perspective, according to Islamic perspective, now, there's one plus one plus one, equal to 1? So it's equal to 3. But, but, you have people who can be a professor in mathematics who will still say 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 1. Right? Am I right? Now, this is what we call as when coming to religion, you no longer use that kind of critical thinking that you have when it comes to the professional world. You will just, just follow. So it's Jahal, Abu Jahal. Now Abu Jahal, he sounds very arrogant. And let me come back to this one very particular story during the Battle of Badr. During the Battle of Badr, a lot of people, because they know the story that this is the guy who go against the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So every one of them are so gung-ho, want to kill this man, Abu Jahal. So they keep on asking, you know, especially the Ansar, they keep on asking, which one is Abu Jahal? They do not know who is Abu Jahal. <laughs> they do not know. They heard about this name, but who is Abu Jahal? Who is Abu Jahal? <laughs> that is the guy. And one companion by the name of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Okay. And Abu Jahal fall down. Okay. He's seriously uh, injured. And he stepped on top of his chest. And, Abu, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, you have to understand, is a very thin guy, very young boy during that time. Very small. 
and from his background, he's not very good background. Okay? He's a shepherd. Stand on top of the chest of Abu Jahal and taking his sword. And you know what did Abu Jahal say? During that time, just imagine if someone wants to kill you, what are you going to say? He said, please, don't kill me. Give me one chance. Right? But you know what Abu Jahal say? Abu Jahal, during the time that he know that possibly that he's going to be killed, he still say, hey, let's just imagine he's lying on the ground and say, hey, young man, you're standing on a very tall ground now. Huh? He's still very arrogant. And isn't it true that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, and he gives the definitions of what is arrogance. Arrogance means someone who rejects the truth. Even you know that it's the truth. Didn't Abu Jahan know that it's the truth? He knew. But he didn't follow and he rejected it. And he fought against it. So arrogant. Same thing with us. When we know... Now, let me ask us a question. Yeah? Do we strongly believe that Islam is the truth? Yes. Not so strong. <laughs> Not so strong. <laughs> if, a, if a singer were to have a concert, you know, we, we, were, we were shout, you know. <laughs> now, do we really believe that Islam is the only truth? Yes. Okay, a bit better now. <laughs> do you believe that the Quran is really the verbatim words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yes. Okay, and you believe that Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger? Yes. Okay, good. Now, come back to us. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be sarcastic here. I just want to be realistic. Everywhere I, I, I went, I try not to be sarcastic. Okay, I just want to raise awareness. I just want to give motivation. Now, if we truly believe in this thing, why we still refuse to submit sometimes? I mean, we are not angel. We cannot be angel. Angel were, you know, 100%. But, you know, in our daily life, when we know this is what Allah says and this is what the Messenger says, what stops us from submitting to Allah and the Messenger? Is it because of our arrogance? No, no, no. I used to be perceived like this. How can I humble myself to the ground? No, no, no. If someone saw me humble myself to the ground, I, I'm, I'm no longer the boss that I know of. I'm no longer the kind of egoistic and arrogant and, you know, strong leader that I look like. Could it be arrogant? Maybe. Just before I came, um, a few days back, I met one non-Muslim. He is a multinational company CEO who have business, business around the world. Okay? He's been an atheist for his entire life. And his story really touched me. And he cried during few time. And you just imagine, this is a multinational CEO. He's flying around every single week. He's flying to Italy, to five continents, everywhere. He's flying. He's been an atheist and he has pos high position, great income. So money is not a problem for him. Position, arrogant. Hey, and he admit he's not someone very arrogant. He's someone very strong. And when he tell me about Allah, he cried. He said, for my entire life, I've been an atheist. But then, when my friends start to give me a Quran, and then I download the app because I could not bring the Quran everywhere I go. So I download the apps, the English translation. And he said, every time I want to mention his name, you know his name? His Allah. I will be like, like this, he said. You know what will happen during the time? He is speechless and he cry. Every time I want to mention, he cannot mention Allah's name. Sometimes he will mention Allah's name. But when I mention his name, I feel so weak. I feel so little. I feel so tiny. Hey, I'm a CEO of a multinational company. I have thousands and thousands of staff under me. I have every single thing that people want to have. But when I just mention his name, I feel very weak. I just feel very weak. I just feel so tiny. I wait for him to cry first. Yeah. yeah. Why, why should you interfere when people cry? Let them cry. Crying out loud. That is a nikmah. That is a blessing from Allah if you can cry. If you cannot cry, you know, you should start to cry why you cannot cry. <laughs> then I told him, you know why? 
Do you know that's why when we want to do our salah, our namaz, we will begin with Allahu Akbar. You know why is Allahu Akbar? Allah is the greatest. When Allah is the greatest, who are you? Without Allah, you are nothing. Allah is the greatest. Your problem is not greater than the mercy of Allah. Your sin is not greater than the mercy of Allah. Your hatred is not greater than the love of Allah towards you. So He is the greatest of everything. Of every single thing which is good. So He said, and few times He break down. And He wants to become a Muslim. Simple, simple da'wah by his friend which is just giving him a Quran and then he downloaded it and that's it and no one forced him and no one really could talk to him about Islam seriously <laughs> just by the Quran so this is another story for me and you that hey Allah can guide someone to Islam without me and you do you think Allah need me and you? no but it is the blessing of Allah that Allah choose you that you have the blessing to do what the job, what the prophet do. It is a blessing from Allah. Never complain. So arrogant. Number two, personal interest. Abu Talib. Abu Talib. Abu Talib, he have a personal interest. You still remember when he want to pass away, he's going to pass away. The messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he back literally, he is begging Abu Talib, oh my uncle, please. Please say La ilaha illallah And I will be witness for you in the day of judgment Just say La ilaha illallah I will be witness for you But what did Abu Talib say? Did Abu Talib believe that the Prophet is a, man, is a prophet? Yes. Yes. Did he love him? Yes, yes. 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 And, and so correct me if I'm wrong I will probably say And I will make this claim anywhere I go I will probably say that most probably Abu Talib loved the Messenger of Allah and protect the Messenger of Allah more than most of us here. <laughs> Seriously. But he didn't follow the Messenger of Allah. And before he died, when after the Prophet back him, he said, this is what Abu Talib said, he said, if it's not because what other people are going to say that me follow the religions of my nephew, I would have accepted it, but no, I'm not going to accept it. What? What did he say? If it's not because other people are going to say, hey man, you're going to die soon, and you're still afraid what people are going to say? <laughs> you're still afraid what people are going to say? Personal interest. He wants to protect his personal interest, his personal reputations. Same thing to us. When we want to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, isn't it true that we refuse to change because what are the people going to say, man? <laughs> I'm not used to pray namaz five times a day. Now I want to pray and suddenly people will say that I become an extremist. <laughs> no, what are the people going to say? Oh, Islam is easy. I should do the nikah easily. But if I do it too easily, people will say, oh, what is this? What other people say? We care so much about what other people say, but we deny what Allah and the Messenger say. But end up, on the day of judgment, the one who is going to admit us to paradise is not what other people say. It's what Allah says. So, personal interest. Lastly, ignorance. Arrogance, ignorance. Like someone, they have valid excuse. That's why I say just now, excuse, there are some which is valid, some which is not valid. But this one, referring to the Negus. The Negus, the Ethiopian king. You know? When the Prophet ﷺ, in the six years of da'wah, he sent a delegation roughly around 80 plus, led by Jafar bin Abu Talib and Usman bin Affan. They went there to Ethiopia. He's a Christian king. And then, of course, Amr bin al As during that time was not a Muslim, and Abu Sufyan, which is not a Muslim during that time, they followed as well. And they tried to instigate the Negus king to send them back. <laughs> you know what, what Abu Sufyan and Amr bin al As says? And there's a lot of lesson when you go through the Sirah. It's all happening because history repeats itself. What Abu, what, what Abu Sufyan and uh, this Amr bin al As says? He says, you know, he's telling the Christian king, King Negus, you know, your religion is better than his religion. By the way, what religion was Abu Sufyan and uh, 
Amr bin Al-As during that time? Paganism. Why are they praising Christian? Do you think they really care about Christianity is better than what Prophet is bringing? They don't care. They will just do whatever they need to do just in order to stop the da'wah of the Prophet <laughs> Even putting their own religion down is fine. They have no problem on that. Okay? But then this King Negus, he was very, you know, fit, being fair, and he asked Jafar, the team, what did your religion say about uh, Jesus? And he recited Surah Maryam. And we know King Negus cried. I cut the story, story short. And then after the Muslim migrated to Medina, Jibril, during that time, is he a Muslim? King Negus? No, he was not a Muslim. But then after the Muslim migrated to Medina, Jibreel came, came and talked, tell, informed uh, Prophet Sallallahu that the King Negus has passed away. What did the Prophet Sallallahu do? Salatu Janazah Gaib. Okay? Now, what does this mean? Is the King Negus Muslim now? Yes. He is a Muslim. But last time, is he a Muslim? No. Why he is not a Muslim? Because he's arrogant or, or what? Because he is ignorant, not because he is arrogant, neither he has personal interest. Okay? But he is ignorant. The same thing that I would like to ask every one of you today. Most of, our, most of our friends out there, who are still, I call it as a not yet Muslim, did they reject Islam because of arrogance or because of personal interest or because of ignorance? Who is the one who's supposed to educate them? Who is the one who's supposed to educate them? <laughs> who is the one who's supposed to educate them? Us. Not us anyway. <laughs> if you say us, it's like, okay, you do, I don't have to do. <laughs> you know? Who, who, who? Me, me, me. Me, 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 me. Don't point to me. It's you. <laughs> don't you. <laughs> you put it upon yourself. It's me. It's my job. And most of them, they rejected Islam. Yes, I know they rejected Islam. But which version of Islam did they reject? Did they reject the version of Islam based on Quran and Sunnah? Or did they reject the Islam that which being narrated by the medias? Which one did they reject? Media. <laughs> the media. So they are not yet rejected the true Islam. They, are reject, they have rejected the false Islam, which is not Islam anyway. So now, Let's go to what is our excuse of not doing that one. Okay, let's give me some of the excuse. Not maybe not you because you guys are here. Let give me some excuse that other people out there who are sharing with you why they are not doing that one. People out there, not you guys, not you guys. Out there, out there. <laughs> not including those people who are in this building. I mean, very far out there. <laughs> and of course, not including our brothers and sisters who are playing hockey right now. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Who, who? What, what is the excuse that we commonly hear for not doing that? What, what would be the excuse? Please share with me. We are not scholars. We are not scholars. Very good. Not enough knowledge. Yeah. Huh? You're the same. Not enough knowledge. Uh, not enough knowledge. What else? What else? Busy. Some people are doing that. Busy. Huh? What then? Some people are doing that. Some people are doing that. Busy. What else? What else? Maybe, maybe we feel like uh, they don't. If we no, not, not you. They, they, they feel like. They feel like. <laughs> no, they feel like if we tell them to talk about Islam, they may. Look towards us. Oh, they will make different. Oh, <laughs> what other people say? <laughs> okay. What else? What else? Uh, we feel bad that it might hurt them. Oh, we feel bad it might hurt them. Okay. Okay. What else? What other excuse? We are losing friends. We are losing friends. Okay. What else? In some cases, we be government. For example, in China, in in the communist China, for example, the Hui people. Okay. They they talk something, and the government will say, hey. Oh, uh, our government is atheist. You, you should not do this. Uh, okay, 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 okay. What else? What else? What are the excuses? Persecution. Yeah. <laughs> Persecutions, okay. What else? Lack of knowledge. That's all the excuses? I thought we have thousand. Less than ten. Rejections, okay. What else? Okay, you see? I have prepared a slide about the excuse. Now, none of you have talked to me about this excuse before, right? None of you came to me, brother, this is the excuse, right? But do you know that this excuse 
that you mentioned, I already listed here. <laughs> Number one. Right? I don't have enough knowledge. This is a most common excuse. Now, I have now another 25 minutes, but I have to cover no less than five excuses. But, inshallah. Because the conclusion remark will be a long story <laughs> about excuse as well from the seerah of the Prophet Now, I don't have enough knowledge. Now, if I were to turn the table around, how, many, how much knowledge is enough? I don't have enough knowledge. How much knowledge is enough then? I just turn the table around. Please, please, please. Is it because there's more people or is it because that uh, they lower down the, the AC? Yeah, there's a... Oh, they're off. The, okay. Because you guys are cool, right? Okay, fine. How much knowledge is enough then? Because you're afraid of confusing them. No, no, this is not answering the question. <laughs> It's good, it's good, it's good. It's good that I, li I like you guys to interact with me. But let's make it very clear. When they say, they, they, they say, not you, <laughs> I don't have enough knowledge. My questions to those people, to those people out there, <laughs> I have to keep on repeat, it's out there, not you guys. Huh? How much knowledge is enough there? Scholars. Scholars? Yeah. <laughs> Scholars, even scholars will say and tell you, I don't have enough knowledge too. <laughs> I would say, uh, the knowledge, you know the best, but verified. Verified. Now, when you say, I don't have enough knowledge, what is the criteria that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi told us that how much knowledge that you need to do that one? Baligu ani? Walau ayah. Just one word. One word. Now, let me bring you this story. Abu Bakar radiallahu an. Excuse, huh? Abu Bakar radiallahu anhu, one of the greatest companions, he, when he just became a Muslim, for the first two days, and just remember this, just remember this, during that time, there's no, just only one, Ikra bismi rabbika lazi khalaqa, was being revealed. No articles of faith, no pillar of Islam, no ihsan, nothing much. But Abu Bakar radiallahu anhu, on the first two days that he became a Muslim. Ten days. What is that? Okay, okay, okay. Ten days. No, not ten days, you see. <laughs> shaitan, shaitan. Kacha. <laughs> On the first two days, ten he do that wa and ten people become Muslim. Now my question to you is how much knowledge did Abu Bakr have during that time? Would you agree with me if I were to say the knowledge that every single one of us have today, right now, right here, yes. including the young kids behind there? Yes. The knowledge that we have today is even more than Abu Bakar when Abu Bakar do his da'wah. Right. Yes or yes? Yes. Yes. yes? yes. But did he find the excuse? Oh, messenger of Allah. <laughs> You know, I just do my shahada. I trust you. You are my best friend. But you know, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Did he say so? No. But he just do it. How many knowledge he have? Not much. So most of us here, I would say all of us here, have more knowledge than Abu Bakr when he's do that one. But why Abu Bakr become the greatest of companion? What's up? Yeah, now what I thought now. It is not his eloquent speech. It is not his knowledge that guide people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No. Yes, I don't deny. If you can speak very well, it can help. But I don't deny that. But the thing is, it is not Abu Bakr who guide. Who is the one who guide? Allah. Allah. What else did he know? Maybe he know La ilaha illallah and Muhammad Rasulullah. That's it. But did that stop him from doing dawah? No. no. Let me bring you to reality. Maybe somebody say, Brother, that is the best of nation 1,400 years ago. <laughs> we, <laughs> we are so far away, brother. Okay, I bring you closer. Not very close, but a few thousand kilometers away. Who is this auntie, by the way? 
as uh, some of you might know, after the workshop here in uh, Hong Kong in April, from 10 to 16 April, I was here. Okay, on the 16th April, I fly back to Malaysia. 17 April, I was there in Malaysia, and on the 18th of April, I fly to Peru and Colombia. Okay, so after one week here in Hong Kong, then I fly to Peru and Colombia. And this sister, I will say, grandmother, she says she became Muslim at the age of 71. 71. Okay, she became Muslim at the age of 71. Her name is Leona. Leonard, at the age of 71, and you know Muslim in Peru, your numbers here in Hong Kong is far greater than them in Peru. In Peru, they have 31 million populations, but Muslim, 5,000 Muslim. You have 8 million populations, but roughly 300,000 Muslim. Far greater in terms of percentage too. Leonard, she became a Muslim one year ago, just last year. So she has been a Muslim less than a year. Less than a year. But almost daily she went and studied, learned. And you know what? She never do that. She don't know how to do that. But after our workshop, you know what she did? Mashallah. Right in front of my eyes, she was like a lion. Lioness. Okay. Lioness. <laughs> she was like a lioness. We told them, now for example, from here, we're supposed to go to somewhere else, to Times Square. But no, this... Just go out from the mosque, whenever he, she saw someone, she is like a lioness that is so hungry, just released from the cage. And boom, boom, boom. I was like, this is 71 years old, man. Why she look like 21 years old? And, less, and just Muslim for, 70, just for less than a year. And she admit, her knowledge is not very, very good. And you know what she did? MashaAllah. This is she. This is her. She go to a place, we have to walk, and whenever she saw someone, hey! They, of course, they speak in Spanish, I don't understand. Okay? They, after they talk, okay, and then she will go, hey, hey! I was like, is this a human or lioness? <laughs> and then she keep on, keep on, keep on. And those people that others, other volunteers do not want to approach because of fear and so on and so forth, because of they are shy. She don't care. She would just talk to anyone. Have you talked to the person? No, no. Oh, she would go. She would just go. And then, you know how Allah reward her? Despite we say that one is not about converting people, that one is about conveying the message alone. You know what Allah reward her? There is a group of family sitting there, six of them. No one attended to them. None of our dai attend to them. Because the, the way they dress is so dirty. No one talked to them. She went and approached them. She went and approached them and she asked me to come. And of course, I get my interpreter to come. I don't understand Spanish. After we talked for 20 minutes, that entire family, six of them, they do the shahada. Allah reward her. How much knowledge she have? Now, how many of you have become Muslim more than you? <laughs> yes. But she did it. She did it. And she's still doing that one. She is still doing that at the age of 71. So what kind of excuse do you have? No knowledge? Do you have enough knowledge? Think about it again. This brother. This was when I was in Uganda. Uganda is a place that you do not receive a lot of rain every year. But Qadr Allah, during that time, it was raining. And we are in our vehicle. And we ask our driver to drive us as close as possible to the classroom so we will not get wet. So we are, because we are dressing like this way. And then when we arrive, this brother, he just arrived with his <laughs> bicycle. So when I went and approached him and I asked him, brother, how far is your house from here? He told me, very near. I said, how near? Very near. How near? Very near. He refused to answer my question. I said, how near? He said, just very near. <laughs> and just imagine during that time it was heavy rain. He has no, he have no, motor, motor, uh, he have no car, just with bicycle. So his entire clothes is wet. So I asked him, what is the duration for you to travel with your bicycle? He said, just very near. Yeah, how near? It's very near, very near. He still refused to tell me. I said, please tell me. So he say, just two hours away. <laughs> just two hours away, Cycling to come and another two hours to go back. 
you can see that his clothes is dirty, wet. He has no excuse not to do that. When I ask him, I mean, I mean, let 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 be very honest here. Did he have all the all the excuses not to attend that day workshop? Yes. 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 Heavy rain, <laughs> heavy rain, and then plus he has no car. Okay, and it's very far. He has all the complete package, not to attend classes, not attend the, to attend the workshop. But did he make it? He make it. He attended the workshop, and he do it for almost nearly a week that we are there in Uganda. Every day cycling. And you over here in uh, Hong Kong, mashallah, you have MTR, you have everything, and you have quite numbers of classes. So if you have no knowledge, if you claim you don't have enough knowledge, the Prophet ﷺ says, seeking knowledge is mandatory upon all Muslims. And if da'wah is wajib, therefore, seeking knowledge to do da'wah is also wajib. It's also fard. We have no excuse. Don't have enough knowledge. Now, this brother, as I told you, right? They have no car. Most of them, they have no car. They just have to walk from one village to another village to do their da'wah. This is our da'i. Will you wear this kind of socks anyway? No, you are not going to wear this kind of socks. But they are wearing this kind of socks because they walk from one village to another village. And most of them, there is only one, one or two of them who have a bicycle. But majority of them, they have no bicycle at all. They just have to walk every single day. And this is a brother who walk and walk and walk. And you can see the manifestations of this. As I say sometimes, maybe this guy, he will step foot in Jannah before us because of the way he strives. We are too comfortable. This is one of the excuses. Number two, I don't know. I don't know. Sound familiar? Yeah, just not, this is some of the excuses that you guys, no, not, not you guys, they have. They have. I don't know. Okay. This is what? Marriage, right? Any one of you who are married here? Yeah. Please raise your hand up. Okay, okay, okay. Can I ask these guys some questions? Yes. Possible? Yes. Let me ask the sister first. Who, who, who amongst you who are married? In suddenly no one. <laughs> you, okay, sister, I would like to ask you. You are married, right? Yes, okay, good. <laughs> Don't be hesitant. <laughs> You are married? Okay, good. Alhamdulillah. May Allah bless your marriage, inshallah. Amen. Yeah. Now, sister, uh, before you get, got married, um, do you know how to become a wife? No. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, brothers, amongst you, who are married? Okay, brothers. <laughs> your wife is there? Yeah. Next to you, alhamdulillah. She will testify against you. Huh? <laughs> before you got married, do you know how to become a husband? No. No, this is something very good for me now. You don't know how to become a wife, neither you know how to become a husband before you got married. But end up, do you got married? Yes. This is something very good for me now. <laughs> because when it comes to da'wah, just by an, a single excuse, I don't know, they stop doing da'wah. But why when it comes to marriage, none of us here, I would say, know how to become a husband or wife, but yet we insist of going to marry. Isn't it a contradiction? Why don't we use the same excuse? I think I don't know how to become a husband, so it's better that we don't get married. Why don't we use the same excuse? Did we? Did we use the same excuse? Are we being double standard here now? We are applying a different rules when it comes to our personal interests. <laughs> but when we also apply a different rules when it comes to what Allah and the Messenger commands. So are we being fair to ourselves? Is it an excuse? Yes. We will say, oh brother, I don't know how to become a husband. But hey, I have to become a husband first before then I learn to become a better husband. Right? Same thing. How many of us know a lot of things? Do you become smart before you go, before you enter kindergarten or primary school? 
Maybe you are a bit genius, so you are a bit smarter than average kids. But then you become more smarter, you become smarter when you enter in school and you learn more. I don't know. It's just an excuse to make us feel good. Who is this guy? Do you watch Olympic anyway? <laughs> this is a swimmer from US. Michael Phelps. Sometimes it's difficult for me to pronounce his name. How do you pronounce? Phelps. Michael Phelps. Whatever. If you okay, I just call him Michael. Easy. Okay, Michael. Now he's a swimmer. Now how he become? Oh, mashallah! Look at the gold medal. How he become an Olympic champion and world champion? Winning so many goals. How? Did he know how to swim when he was born? No. But how he became a world champion? An Olympic champion? And he is the greatest ever athlete. He has won the most gold in Olympic. How he achieved such a status? Did he know? No, he don't know. Just imagine if today, if today there is an Olympic champion swimming, he become a champion. He do not become a champion in Olympic or in world athletic or world swimming competition just because he learned something in the classroom. But he become the best swimmer and the world champion because he jump into the pool and he swim. Do you think that he ever drink some water from the pool? When he first started, yes. just like most of us, yes, yes, he might drink more than us. But because of that things, he become the world champion. Same thing with us. We keep on learning and learning, which is very good. But if we keep on learning the theoretical, but we don't put it into practical, when we're going to become the expert? If what you learned about marriage is good, but you didn't apply it. How can it benefit your marriage? If you learned about Islam, but you didn't practice it, how could it be benefit to you? I don't know. It's not a valid excuse, because once upon a time there's a lot of things that we do not know. Do you know how to become super rich? Do you know how to become a billionaire? But are those people who are billionaire today? Do they know how to become a billionaire? No. They learn from people who already won. Same thing. We do not know how to do da'wah. So should we learn how to do da'wah then? Yes. And we should learn from people who know how to do da'wah. So I do know, apply this principle across our life. Never be double standard in how we apply Islam. Don't cherry picking. Islam is full time, not part time, not some time. Because we can die anytime. So practice Islam full time, don't cherry pick. Okay? Now, I'm afraid. <laughs> How many of you who are afraid now? No, outside, outside. Outside, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Outside people. How many outside people who are afraid? <laughs> outside people are afraid. Huh? Let's see. Put yourself in that situation. We were there when this guy shout like a WWE announcer. Watching this video make you scared. Just put yourself, you were there. <laughs> and we were there. Looking at this guy. He's like shouting. This is like going to give him some, you know, in terms of psychology, some cutting edge, you know, some advantage. But no, he can shout all he wants. But it's okay. Because we know we have the truth on our side and we have Allah on our side. Come what may, bring it on. We are not afraid because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Surah Al-Isra, chapter 17, verse number 81. Say, the truth have come 
and the falsehood will perish. And indeed, the falsehood will perish. We have the truth. And you claim, you admit it just now, that we believe that Islam is the truth. Am I right? But Allah says, وَقُلْ جَاهَاكُ وَزَاهَاكُ بَاتِلْ إِنَّ بَاتِلَ كَنَ زَهُوكَ That when the, for, when the truth come, the falsehood will perish. But now the falsehood is being circulated around, is being spread around, because those who have the truth keep it to themselves. Because of fear. What are you going to be afraid of? Because at the end of the day, they will die, you will die. It's just a matter how you're going to die. What are you so afraid of? It's how you're going to die. You don't have to wait to die. No need. The, the angels of death will come to you. You can hide, but you can never run. They will come to you. And in Islam, we learned about Tawhid. You know Tawhid, right? Monotheism. That in Tawhid, we learn that we should love Allah more than anything else. That is the peak of Tawhid. And we should fear Allah more than anyone else. And we say we're afraid. Now, I want to put you guys into perspective. Into these situations. Put aside those reverts. Yeah? Not applicable for reverts. You are involved in that one now. Huh? And a non-Muslim come to you and say, uh, Sister, brother, I'm interested in Islam. I've been studying about Islam for quite some time. You know, I'm, I'm very convinced that Islam is the truth. But I'm afraid what my friends going to tell to say. I'm afraid that my my family member will boycott me. I'm afraid that my family members will kick me out. I'm afraid that my family member will hurt me. I'm afraid so many things. Now you as a dying, what are you going to advise this person? He is he have so much fear. What are you going to advise him? Or you will say, I I think uh, if. Like that, better than you don't become Muslim. <laughs> yeah, yeah, who's going to take care of you if your parents are going to hit you, man? You know, your friends, you know, you have, you have no more friends. So it's better that you don't become Muslim, stay where you are, so your friend will accept you and your parents will not hit you. Stay where you are. But if you die, you will be burned in hellfire, okay? No problem. <laughs> are you going to tell them this way? No. So what are you going to tell them? Oh, fear what, 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 okay, again? I, I heard it from here. What? Fear Allah. Fear Allah. Okay, okay, okay. Good. Take that advice. Take her advice, not my advice. Take her advice and fear Allah. Not any creation. If you can advise a non-Muslim who really want to become a Muslim and he, he is so convinced about the truth about Islam but he has so many fears around him but you will still say, no worry, on the day of judgment you will still die alone and you will be buried alone and you will face Allah alone and you will answer all the questions alone. Yeah. So just do it, right? Yeah. Same thing. Use the same thing to yourself by saying, why should I be afraid? When? When I die, I'm going to die alone. I will be buried alone, I will be resurrected alone, and I will be questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. You must fear Allah more than anything else. But of course, Allah is al-wadud. He is love. Let's put into this. Hey. Okay. We we'll talk about fear, afraid. Let's talk about the story of Moses. 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 Now, Musa alayhi salam. He was surrounded by the army of Pharaoh, Pharaoh, Pharaoh. And then, now when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded Musa, you, Musa, go and talk to Pharaoh, to Pharaoh. What did Musa reply? He said, I'm afraid. <laughs> same, same, same. He's, a, he's still a human being like us. He, he is afraid. Did he fear? He afraid. He is afraid. But then, did Musa alayhi salam went and talked to Pharaoh? Yes. yes. Despite he had fear in his heart, but he still do it. This is called courage. Courage is not the absence of fear, but courage is to do what is right despite the existence of fear. That is courage. And you need courage to do it. And your courage can only come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
That's why when we do our azan, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, we will repeat the same thing. But when it comes to Hayyala Salah, do we repeat Hayyala Salah? No. We repeat what? La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. There is no power and strength except from Allah. Hayyala Falah, there is no power. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Why Salah and Hayyala Falah, we will repeat differently? Because to do Salah, you can't do it without the power and strength from Allah. To achieve success, you cannot have success without the power and strength from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's all. And for us to have that kind of courage is none other than you have fear towards Allah, you have taqwa towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than anything else. Did the Prophet sallallahu he have fear? Yes, he did. When he want to approach people, he have fear too, he is afraid too. But did he stop? No. If he have no fear, why did he have to plan so much? to do the hijra because he is afraid but he still plan same thing we are afraid but we stop there no we don't stop we plan how to overcome the fear rather than to succumb to the fear never fear of rejection too just imagine those of you who are married when you want to propose to your spouse do you have the fear of rejection or you are so confident now ah, he's going to marry me <laughs> no, you still have the fear of rejection. But at the end of the day, do you do it? Yes. Do you propose? If you never propose, you will never have the result. The same thing. If you never try, how do you know the acceptance and the rejections? Don't have fear. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. Okay, I'm not good enough. Very, very, very quick one. I'm not good enough. I just make a very, com I just make comparison. Okay, I just make a comparison. According to the original scriptures, huh? original scriptures of the Bible, original teaching that we know of, according to the perspective of Islam. Now, is there anyone among us here today who take beer? Beer? No. No? I, I, I took, I took beer. Yeah, yeah, I took beer. Root beer, ginger beer. You don't? You don't took this kind of beer? Yeah, it's not very healthy anyway. But, but, but better you stop beer. You know why beer? Beer is B-E-E-R. Beginning, enjoy, ending, regret. Yeah? So better stop. Beginning? Beginning, enjoy, ending, regret. This is B-E-E-R anyway. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, now, any one of us, now, none of us who consume alcohol. Right? Am I right? Now, did the Christians consume alcohol? Yes. In the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is better? Muslim or Christian? It seems like you are not so confident. Huh? Now, do we Muslim take... Now, any one of us here who, who take uh, alcohol, consume alcohol? No. Sounds like not so confident. <laughs> did the Christians consume alcohol? Yes. And they are missionary? Yes. 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 So in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is better? Muslim. Muslim. Did any one of us took eat pork? No. 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 Did they took eat pork? Yes. In Leviticus chapter 11, verse number 7 and 8, they are not supposed to touch swine, but they eat. In the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is better? Muslim. 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 Now, did any one of us involved in gambling? No. 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 We don't. Did they gamble? Yes. Yes. In the sight of Allah, who is better? Do we fornicate? No. Do we commit zina? No. no. You know Jimmy Swaggart? The one who debated with Sheikh Ahmad Didat? He was caught twice. With prostitute twice. But yet that didn't stop him from propagating Christianity. In the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we, the Muslim, who didn't commit fornications and adultery, and Jimmy Swaggart, who is better? Not confident? Who is better? Muslim. Muslim. Now, if they in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are not much better than us. And they commit more sins in the perspective of Islam, more than any one of us here. But yet, they have the gut and courage to continue to propagate Christianity. Why can't you? Why can't you? So you have to understand this. This Napoleon, not little Napoleon, he did say, the, wild, the violence of this world is, is not due to only of the actions of the bad people. 
but it is due to the silence of the good people okay because those good people like you you are good alhamdulillah you want islam you want to practice islam alhamdulillah but you keep it you have you are someone who have the torchlight who can lighten up the entire room but you let them to continue to be in darkness you do not want to show them the way how selfish we are so I'm not good enough brothers and sisters trust me if you are Muslim you are good enough because it took courage for someone to say Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah because it come together with submissions and obedience and how many people during the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam they know Islam is the truth but yet they have not no courage to take the shahada which means if you are Muslim you are good enough you are good enough despite you might have seen here and there i'm not saying you should continue but who didn't commit sin a saint have their past a sinners have their futures too so continue just do i'm busy i need to work study for a better future i'm busy do you have time for tea anyway do you have time for tea time do you have time for instagram facebook do you have time for sport do you have time for tv movie Oh you have all this time huh but why when it come to that one no time I'm busy double standard double standard okay thank you so much <laughs> double standard for a better future I would like to highlight this for a better future what is the future what is the future look like let me give you this reality today brothers and sisters How many hours a day do we work just in order to be successful in this world? 12, 14, 16 hours? Right? In order to be successful in this world? But is it guaranteed? No. No, it's not guaranteed. But how much hard work we put? How much effort we put? How many times we spend? 14, 16 hours a day. Just in order to achieve success. Am I right? It's not guaranteed. But let me tell you and put you down to come back to the reality. Surah Al Imran chapter 3 verse 185. Kullu nafsi zaikatu maut. That every living being would taste would taste death. They would die. This is confirmed and this is guaranteed. Now, I would like to ask you, how much time and effort and money that you spend prepare for that future? Better future. How much time you spend? And you know what brother and sister the things that motivate me the things that motivate me might be the things that motivate you most probably inshallah i don't have million in my bank account i don't have okay what if i will have a million that millions dollar us dollar whatsoever will not look up will not take care of my children of my and my offspring But if I left them with Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala that will be sufficient for them. For our future death is confirmed. Kullu nafsi zaikatu maut. And we know the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that when someone pass away when the son of Adam pass away everything will be cut off except three. The dua of a righteous children their sadaqah their charity and lastly is the beneficial knowledge. Isn't it dawa is part of beneficial knowledge? Yes, and this thing will continue. Just imagine you are teaching someone a class, new revert, or you're calling someone to Muslim to become a Muslim, and that person become a Muslim. Masha Allah, and whatever Fatiha, Alif, Lam, Mim, every single thing that he going to recite his entire life, and if he were to marry it, and his children continue and continue and continue, you know what's going to happen to your bank account for the hereafter? That even though that you have passed away, keep on increasing. even you no longer can do your namaz every day but that is your saving that is your fixed deposit for a better future now this guy this guy this girl sorry i have five minutes okay five minutes this girl very interesting this was in, in colombia her name is alexandria she, but she is not from colombia she is from venezuela She is traveling, she travel two days and two night, spending all her money, her saving in order to attend to travel from Venezuela to Bogota to attend our dawah workshop. 
18 years old girl. 18 years old girl. Two days and two nights, just have plain water, some biscuits, and some bread. That's it. She don't even eat rice. She could not afford it. She and the best thing, brother and sister, <laughs> she is not a Muslim yet. A non-Muslim travels two days, two nights from Venezuela to Colombia, spending all her saving in order to learn how to do dawah. <laughs> it's a dawah workshop, you know. It's not an Islamic workshop. 18 years old girl. And you know her investment. This is her investment. There is a long story about what Peru, what happened in Peru and Colombia. Her investment, because of her sincerity, inshallah, and because of her effort, Allah paid it off. During the workshop, she became Muslim. And not only that, she spent nearly 200,000 peso, and we gave her back more than 1 million peso which Hong Kong dollar come to four or five thousand which mean a lot for them and every single one of the participants close to 45 of them every one of them received minimum 500 to 600 thousand peso as a form of charity for them for encouragement they make time for it there are quite a number of non-Muslims who attended the workshop but Alhamdulillah I would say all of them who attended as a non-Muslim, they go back as a Muslim. Despite we are teaching them how to do da'wah. And you know what the best thing? They as a non-Muslim, they learn how to do da'wah. And we go down to the field, they went and approached other non-Muslims to become Muslim when they are not a Muslim yet. And you as a Muslim, afraid? I'm busy? No time? Think about it. Lastly, brother and sister, you know, this brother Mario, he's 1,000 kilometers away from Bogota. And he cried because he's the only Muslim there. There is no Muslim in his land before he become Muslim. And no one ever do da'wah to him. But how he, de- how he become Muslim? Just by internet. Again, a story for me and you. Allah doesn't need, didn't need me and you. Allah give you the opportunity. Lastly, brothers, this will be my story, last one. Okay? Just give me a few more minutes, okay? Boleh, ya? Boleh, ya? Just say boleh. 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 Okay. Okay. You know Ka'ab bin Amali? This is a story that is very inspiring. Ka'ab bin Amali radiallahu an, he never missed a single battle during the lifetime of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But he only missed one, which is the battle of Tabuk. The battle of Tabuk. And for the battle of Tabuk, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam have already informed the companion that we will go for war. So prepare for it. None of the war before, the Prophet prepared them, but except this one. So this time, Ka'ab say, I have prepared two good horse. Okay? Very strong one. Weapon, done, everything. But when it comes to the moment the Prophet Wasallam commanded the Muslim, okay, let's go. We march to Tabu. But Ka'ab in Malik during that time, he was being tested by Allah just the way how Allah tested the Jews which on Saturday they are not supposed to go for fishing but Saturday Allah make all the fish come out <laughs> and when it comes to this battle of Tabuk Ka'ab bin Malik he was preoccupied he's so occupied with his own farm the dead palm because it's the time the season come so he said it's okay it's okay they go first. I have two good horse. I should be able to catch up, inshallah. <laughs> Just like us. It's okay, you do that one first. Eh? Later I will come. But they will come. So they say, go, go. But you know what? End up, the Muslim, they travel so far, and Ka'ab didn't make it. He didn't make it. After 19 days, the Prophet ﷺ came back and he prayed to Raka'at. It's his sunnah. Whenever he come back from traveling, he will pray to Raka'at in Masjid Nabawi. And then, during that time in Medina, Ka'ab ibn Malik himself narrated this story. He said, when all the army was there, were out there in Tabu, what I saw remained in Medina was wo- women who were exempted from the battle, the young kids, the young boy, okay, the old man, and the munafikun. Now, which category did Ka'ab bin Malik belong to? None of it. None of it. He is a good believer. None of it. So when the Prophet came back, he called 
close to 80 of them who didn't make it to Tabo. Come, come, come. So, ask them, why you are not there? The Munafikun give excuse. And the Prophet, okay, go. You, come. Okay, go, go, go. When they come to Ka'ab in Mali, he's still thinking about giving excuse to the Prophet. <laughs> While he's walking to the Prophet. And when the Prophet called Ka'ab, the Prophet called Ka'ab, is like, we call the cat. He's like, Ka'ab. You know, this is very sarcastic, huh? Come. He, while he's still walking to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is still thinking, ah, oh, they give excuse. And they're okay. They're being released by the Prophet. I think if I give excuse, should be okay then. When he reached the Prophet Sallallahu sit just right in front of the messenger. Before the Prophet asked him anything, he tell the Prophet, Oh, messenger of Allah, just now while I'm walking here, I was thinking what kind of excuse that I want to give you because I saw that they gave excuse and you release them and you exempt them from all this punishment. To be honest, I'm still thinking about it. But then when I sit right in front of you, I know you will know what is in my heart because if I were to lie to you, if I were to give excuse to you, Allah will surely tell you. So, O Messenger of Allah, I have no excuse not to involve in the battle of Tabu except that I'm too busy handling my farm. Didn't reply much and the Prophet said, okay, you go. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he commanded the, all the Muslim to boycott Ka'ab and another two companions. Not talking to them and not even answering their salam. And their wife also being commanded to boycott Ka'ab in Umale. You know, giving salam in Islam is sunnah, but to reply is wajib. But not even reply their salam for close to 50 days. And Ka'ab in Umale himself say, I feel like I want to die. I feel so bad. I feel like I want to die. But then one day after Fajr prayers, one of the companions came to, the prof came to him and said, Ka'ab, rejoice! Be happy! Because Allah has pardoned you. And then Ka'ab was asking, is the Prophet himself is the one who pardoned me or what? No, Allah revealed a verse in the Quran to pardon you. And he went to the Prophet Sallallahu and he said, O oh Messenger of Allah, I repent, I make my tawbah. And as a sign of my repentance, I will give all this wealth of mine for you, for da'wah, for fisa bilillah. And then the Prophet asked, then what do you left for your family? No worry, Messenger of Allah. I left with them Allah and the Messenger and what I have from the Battle of Khaybar. And then it was narrated from that day onwards. Ka'ab ibn Malik radiallahu an, until the day he died, he never missed a single battle anymore. So brother and sister, this is bring to our closing and conclusion for our rest, for our Zuhur prayer. Ka'ab ibn Malik, he is a believer. The Munafikun, they give excuse and the Prophet release them, but they will be punished in the hereafter. But we are believers and Ka'ab ibn Malik, he is a believer. That's why just now I started this talk of mine with the quotation from the Quran. Surah Al-Azab, chapter 33, verse number 70 and 71. Ya ayyuhallazina amanu taqullah. Oh, you who believe. Allah is calling you who believe. Have taqwa, have piety, have righteousness. Wa kulu kaulan sadida and speak the speech of truth. Never give excuse. Yuslih lakum akma lakum wa yafir lakum zunubakum. Verily, Allah will improve and increase your ibadah, your worship, and Allah will forgive your sin. Wa may yuti ilaha wa rasulahu. And whosoever who obey Allah and His Messenger. Faqad faza fawzan azimah. And those are the ones who achieve, who attain great success. When Allah says great success, what does it mean? Success. Great success means Jannah. Jannah. So never give excuse. So, brothers and sisters, if you find it important, you will find a way. But if not, you will find an excuse. So make no more excuse. And start doing da'wah until the end of your life in this world in the hope that Allah will accept every single deed how small it is that it will be 
put into our account and Allah because of due to that Allah will admit us into paradise and save us from the torment of the hellfire inshallah inshallah so brothers and sisters in Islam and in humanity we're going for our Zohar break and uh, our lunch break and when we come back I will be covering a very specific topic it's about how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi interact with the non-Muslim in his time and how can we apply it in our time today inshallah so once again jazakumullah khairan wa akhirun da'wana assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh